Okay. So here we are at Kijakuta in Raj Rajagaha and in the old city in the mountains. Mountains, if you look on the map, it's the only range of mountains in, in the area, so it's a fairly special geographic, uh, geologically. It's called Gujjakuta, means vulture's peak, because supposedly these rocks in the background, 2600 years ago, they looked like a vulture, they still kind of do. So many of the places we've come to are, uh, We've come to many places outside of the four holy sites, the four places recommended by the Buddha, or that the Buddha said were beneficial for one to come to visit on a pilgrimage. We have the place of the Bodhis Bodhisattva's birth, we've seen. We have the place where the Bodhisattva became enlightened that we'll be seeing next. The place where he first taught and the place where he passed away, those are the four main sites. But there's lots of other sites worth seeing that uh, represent highlights of the Buddha's life. And Kijakuta is one of those places. You could say that our visits to these sites are a, a celebration of the Buddha's life. It's the one thing that's missing from the four sites, right? We don't have anything that celebrates the Buddha's life. And all the rest of these places do that. Kijakuta is a special place in that regard, I think, because it's it's the first place the Buddha chose as a dwelling place. Before, before coming here, he, he chose places based on a reason for being there. In the Bodh Gaya, where he became enlightened, and Isipatana, where he first taught. But as soon as he finished teaching, uh, his decision, his choice of places to come was Vulture's Peak. He went to teach uh, somewhere in the hills. He taught Uruvela Kasapa and uh, Nadi Kasapa and Gaya Kasapa. But once he had taught, this was the place where he chose to live in Vulture, in, in Rajika before Veluana was was given as a monastery. And many places, Jetavana, which we've seen, were given as monasteries and the Buddha acquiesced to live there, but this place sort of reminds one much more of the sort of place the Buddha himself would choose. So today uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about life. Celebrating the Buddha's life. Celebrating life seems a little odd. I mentioned earlier that a lot of Buddhists say that life is suffering, that the, that the first noble truth is that life is suffering. I think I got it wrong earlier. I said that in the book, what the Buddha taught, he actually makes a note of this. He says that uh, a lot of people, so he got it right, a lot of people say this, but he says, actually, that's not what the First Noble Truth is. And I've, I've brought that up before and had people comment on it saying that, well, but isn't that just semantics if you say that not all life is suffering? What about the Buddha saying the five aggregates are suffering? And so I think we should clear up one very important point in Buddhism, of course, because suffering is such an important teaching, is understanding what is meant by the word, well, dukkha, actually. Some people are hesitant to translate it as suffering. I'm not so concerned about that, but if you do translate it as suffering, you have to explain what that means. 
we should also explain what we mean by the five aggregates because it's also such a very important teaching of the Buddha. So the five aggregates are rupa, form, which is physical form, vedana, feelings, sanya, meaning memory or uh, recognition, sankhara, meaning thoughts, uh, formations, but what you think of something, how you react to it, extrapolate on it, and vijnana, meaning uh, consciousness. And these are often taken to, to, to be thought of as what's in here, right? If you look at this body, you say, this body is made up of five aggregates. The ultimate reality isn't actually like that, because, of course, the body is just a concept. You look and you see the body. You, you get a conception in your mind on my body. You look at the hand and you get a conception that's a hand. And in reality, there is moments of experience seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. And all of these six types of experience give rise to or are, are made up of. That's the experiences that are made up of the five aggregates. And that constitutes life from a Buddhist perspective, these experiences, right? So one could say, well, if those things are suffering, then that means all of life is suffering, right? It's, a, it's an easy conclusion to come to. Unfortunately, it's a simplistic conclusion to come to. It really is. First of all, because the word dukkha, dukkha could be, could be used generally in two ways. It could mean something that is painful, or it could mean the pain itself, physical or mental. You know, if you're sad, that's suffering. If you're in pain, that's suffering. But as a philosophy, it, it's like something being hot, fire being hot. Fire is a really good example or analogy. Fire isn't really hot, but we say it's hot because when we touch it, when we grasp it, it burns us. We feel the heat. We feel hot, but that's because we're conscious. So the heat comes from our experience of it. And, and if we leave it alone, if we don't grasp at it, it's not painful. Now, with experience, it's not the same in that we're not saying that every experience you have is painful, is dukkha. But the dukkha comes because the Buddha didn't actually say the five aggregates are suffering. He said, the five aggregates of clinging, or the, the aggregate of clinging to uh, each of these five things is suffering. And so that's where the idea of grasping at the fire comes from. Experience is something like experiencing fire. If you see a fire in front of you, it's not hot. There's no heat that comes from it until you get close. Until you, and, and even then it's not painful until you grab, put your hand in the fire. And we know this because, of course, an enlightened being has a life. We know this because of the Buddha's example. It's a very clear part of aspect of Buddhism. The Buddha didn't immediately disappear from samsara and didn't immediately stop having experiences when he became free from suffering. So we can say, in, in some sense, he was free from suffering, but he wasn't free from dukkha. But that means he wasn't free from things that were, and some people like to translate as, unsatisfying. And he didn't have to be free from them, because they weren't a problem, because he wasn't putting his hand in them, right? And that's the truth. That's why mindfulness is so powerful. It's not about escaping suffering. The practice is not about escaping suffering, even though you could say, in some sense, that's a goal. It's about understanding it, and understanding removes the problem without having to remove the thing that you thought was problematic. It turns out that our experiences aren't problems, it's our reactions to them. It's the clinging to them, good or bad, or me, mine. So in some sense, celebrating life isn't a problem. Life can be perfectly wonderful, but, and here's where we have to make an important distinction that 
There's a very great difference between celebrating life and living a life worth celebrating. You know, a lot of a lot of non-Buddhists talk about celebrating life. Non-religious people believe in living life to its fullest, which isn't actually technically, you know, if you just take it at face value, that that's not, I think, against Buddhism. Uh, some people talk about uh, celebrating life. They have a spirituality, maybe not religion, but they would call it a spirituality where life is a some kind of vague sort of blessing to be celebrated, to be enjoyed really is the point. Celebrating life is is, is very much tied up with uh, enjoyment and sensuality. Living a life worth celebrating. Why we celebrate the Buddha's life is because he, his life was worth celebrating. And so our practice is not about celebrating life, it's about cultivating qualities of, of mind, you know, moving towards a state of being that is worth celebrating, that is worth rejoicing over. Because there are many kinds of life. Life in hell is probably not worth celebrating. It's not really. You could you could argue for some kind of objectivity and say don't don't be hard on those people in hell. But the whole point of it being hell is it's caused by unwholesomeness. It's caused by anger. It's not worth celebrating anger or the the result of anger. It only causes great great suffering in those people who live in hell. Animal realm not really worth worth rejoicing in. Celebrating life as a monkey that where they what do they do? They bite each other's eyeballs off. Someone said this morning. I've never seen that. I heard that they, they will bite each other's faces off. It's pretty gruesome. Life as a ghost not worth celebrating. Lots of ghosts out there apparently that there was a ghost that was a backbiter. He would uh Backbiting is an English term. In English idiom, it means uh, speaking behind people's back. You know, you're all nice to their face, but you bite them on the back. Means you talk bad about them. You make everyone hate them. Spread rumors, bad rumors about them, that sort of thing. And this ghost, when he was reborn, he he actually had long nails, and he actually gouged flesh out of his back. It was some. He was just in such a crazed state of mind that this is what he would do. Life as a human might be worth celebrating, might not. Some humans, obviously, their lives are not worth celebrating. And that's objective. It's not a judgment or a hatred of those people. It's just unfortunate that they're wasting their lives. Most of us waste part of our, parts of our lives. And that's in Buddhism what we strive to, to, to change. We take people like the Buddha as our example of someone who didn't waste his life. He wasted 29 years of his life, to some extent. Uh, and, and then another six more he wasted. But when he turned 35, he stopped wasting time. And so we remember the qualities of the Buddha. We remember the greatness and the 45 years that he spent teaching tirelessly as a celebration of his life. When we talk about ourselves living a life worth celebrating, we we can think of the Buddha's words you know, we talk in some religious some religious people talk about eternal life. You know, the problem with celebrating celebrating life from a Buddhist perspective is that it's wrong-headed. Whether it be 
celebrating the short time you have on life, carpe diem, you only live once, that sort of thing. Whether it be the Hindu sense of just enjoying the game that you're playing from life to life, it's just illusion, it's a game. Or whether it be the Christian idea or the Muslim idea of eternal heaven. It's because it, it focuses on results, it focuses on the enjoyment of happiness. And people, even whether they be humans or even angels, when they get caught up in enjoying happiness, they lose track of what it is that allows them to find happiness. Why is it that we're even born humans, but more, why are we, why are we surrounded by good people? Why are our relationships beautiful and, and harmonious? And conversely, why are they not? You know? People who, who, who when, when we take up this philosophy of celebrating, enjoying life, even the idea of an eternal life, you know, how would heaven be talked about? It would be an eternal life of enjoyment, of pleasure. Something about uh, surrounded by beautiful women is a thing you hear in some crazy religious cults. We don't realize what the, the consequences of that sort of sensual enjoyment are, that the people who engage in those sorts of hedonism are the first to fight with each other, to manipulate others, to be jealous, to be frustrated and angry and irritated. We don't realize how, how these qualities of mind arise in, 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 uh, in proportion to our fixation on happiness, on pleasure. And it, it, it becomes more clear as you become more mindful that your, hap your happiness, your actual and true happiness is only in, pro in conversely in proportion to your, it's in proportion to the cause that you, you, you build, you, you grow, you, you plant. when you cultivate the cause. And so Buddhism, that's why living a life worth celebrating is a much more way of, better way of talking about it, because the beautiful and wholesome and, and the good qualities that you develop are the cause of all happiness. The harmony that comes in someone who is generous and kind and caring and thoughtful and mindful and wise. The interactions and the relationship with their surroundings, you know, how, how peaceful we can be on this, this uh, pilgrimage, even though we might be surrounded. For some of us, we've never experienced the craziness and the um, chaos and unpredictability of India, of a, of a developing con uh, country. <coughs> and yet, even though this might be very foreign to you, you can see how mindfulness helps you to stay calm and to stay peaceful. It also lets you see that not everyone lives in such luxury as we might have grown up with. And we can see that simply engage, indulging in the, the pleasure that we seem to have been so lucky to, just lucky almost. We don't even know why we're here. In Buddhism, we would say, well, there's karma involved, right? But regardless, it's certainly not everyone who, who has the potential to enjoy life the way we might. It was one of the things that the Buddha saw. He saw that even as a king, he, he couldn't escape this potential that he saw in other people, old people, sick people. He realized that it's not, a, it's not a tenable philosophy to just enjoy. 
So celebrating life becomes problematic. Unless it means living a life worth celebrating, which is, of course, I think much better. So how do we live a life worth celebrating? This is what I was getting at. The Buddha's words in one of the Dhammapada verses, he says, Appamado amata padang Pamado machuno padang Appamata namiyanti Ye pamata yathamata Appamado appamada Pamada means Mada means uh, intoxication Pamada is also intoxication But here it doesn't mean through it means the sort of metaphorical intoxication that we talk about, figurative intoxication that we talk about, being intoxicated by sensuality, being intoxicated by youth, strength, uh, being intoxicated with life, being intoxicated with health, feeling very healthy. You know. Being negligent is how we often translate it, but intoxicated is really the literal. So appamada means not in, not to intoxicated. Having a clear mind is is exactly it. Having a so, uh, sober might not be sober is perfectly literal, but it just has connotations. It really means what is about sobriety. It means your mind is still clear, unaffected, uninebriated, unintoxicated. Appamado amata padang. Pala, it's the path. Pada, it's the path. Amata, the path to not dying. So if you ever were to, the Buddha never talked about eternal life, it would be a little bit misleading, but he talked about not dying. You don't have to die. Appamado amata padang, pamado machuno padang. Intoxication is the path to death, the path of death. Appamatta namiyanti, those who are unintoxicated never die. Namiyanti, don't die. Ye pamatta yatamata, ye pamatta yatamata. Those ye Pamatta, those who are intoxicated, yatha, are like those matta, who are dead. Someone who is intoxicated is already dead. So it's a life not worth, not worth celebrating. It's not even really a life. And so, one of the problems people often have with Buddhism is it's about letting go, it's about leaving samsara, it's about freeing yourself from the rounds of rebirth. But it turns out that it's really about finding, cultivating and, and attaining a state of life that is worth living, that is worth celebrating, that is uh, a cause of peace and, and happiness. That of all the lives that even though you might be born again and again and somehow rejoice in that fact without mindfulness, without uh, clarity of mind, you're not really alive. There's so much stress and suffering and blindness like a zombie, you know, people think of people who practice, they talk about us who practice meditation, oh, you look like zombies, you must just be like zombies, and it's exactly the opposite. Before we practice mindfulness, we're like zombies. And mindfulness is the, the key component of sobriety or non-intoxication in Buddhism. Satya avipavaso appamato tiwuchati. What do we call appamada? When you're mindful, when you're never without mindfulness. Mindfulness meaning to remember. Mindfulness means the state of being, having a clear mind. 
being completely present with the experience. It means to remember, literally, right? So what that means is you remember the present moment. There's not a, a, a slipping away from the experience into reaction, into extrapolation, into identification. And so we come right back to this idea of the five aggregates. They are our life, they are our reality, they are our experience. And so they are our object of mindfulness, our object of meditation. When we see, when we hear, when we smell, when we taste, when we feel, when we think. The quality of mind that is clearly aware without judgment of any sort or identification or attachment, without anything else, without getting lost. When the mind knows seeing is seeing, dite dita matang. Seeing is just seeing, sutte sutta matang. Hearing is just hearing. When we attain that, it actually means we're just living. It's true life. No. What would it mean to live life to its fullest from a Buddhist perspective? It means you wouldn't. When you walk, you would be there. When you go somewhere, you are there. When you talk to someone, you are talking. Not you are talking, but the act of talking is the, is the reality, not, oh, I hate this person, I should stop talking to them, or, oh, I really like this person, how can I manipulate them to like me? Oh, I'm worried, am I going to say the right thing and the wrong thing? Instead, talking is your reality. Walking is your reality. Eating, drinking is your reality. When you eat, you eat. You don't talk or think or crave or like. No. And, there, and thus you are present, you are, you are here and now. And though it might, uh, rationally speaking, think that you, you lose a lot, because, oh, then you can't like things or just, no, there's no personality there. Why we, why we continue this is because of what we've seen, how, how peaceful that state is. Because the truth of it is that you let go of it a lot. You let go of all your baggage. That our, our attachments, our partialities, our judgments are mostly just a lot of baggage that causes us stress and suffering. We come to meditation practice usually because we wonder, why do I suffer so much? Why, why is there stress in my mind? People who have mental illnesses come wondering, how can I free myself? Why are these, why am I so depressed, so anxious? How can I free myself from these things? Please, any way to free myself from these things. And we realize that it's all just our inability to be present. And we find great peace and happiness, freedom from suffering. We find life in the present moment. So, that's my thoughts on life. So far we've done birth, death, life. We'll have one more talk in Bodhgaya, and then we're going home. Thank you all for listening.